Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Cool. All right, hello. My name is Kenneth Finnegan. Uh, Chris cold called me a couple months ago and said, hey, I met you last year at Maker Faire and heard, heard about your thesis. Can you come down and talk? Or up and talk, I guess. Um, being the nice guy that I am, I'll never say no to an invite to drive up to a club. And so I came up from San Jose this morning, or uh, this evening, and am talking to you guys today about my experience on the Wildflower Triathlon. Uh, talking a little bit about me, my, myself first. Uh, I was first licensed in 2008. I upgraded to Extra in 2009. I got licensed because my father had always wanted to get licensed and decided to just live vicariously through me. <laughs> he, he figured it was a lot easier to just buy me the book and make me do all of it. I eventually made him go back and get his license as well, so he's also licensed. I got my BS in Mechanical Engineering from UC Davis, followed by an Electrical Engineering Master's degree from Cal Poly. Um, I met a couple buddies that uh, eventually became good friends of mine through field day during, during my undergrad, and they talked me into transferring to Cal Poly for my MSEE. So it's amateur, amateur radio is the reason I transferred and became an electrical engineer. My master's thesis while at Cal Poly was on APRS. Yay. This is originally my master's thesis was going to be looking at just the amateur Bell 202 modem. But as I started to dig more and more into APRS, I realized that the biggest issue with APRS wasn't the modem. It was the fact that there's no, nothing even resembling a specification for it. And so my master's thesis was just looking at all of Bob's ramblings on the mailing lists and figuring out what we don't even really know. So I, I have a, it's about a 70 page document just talking about ambiguities in APRS. So if you're bored and want to have a fun read, it's a bucket of fun. Um, other than that, in, in my free time, I'm mostly, it, when it comes to amateur radio, I'm primarily based on VHF and UHF FM, um, primarily focused on repeater systems, infrastructure, digipeters, uh, solar off the grid systems. So last month, I, for the West Valley Club in San Jose, I gave a whole talk on sun-powered radios. That video will hopefully eventually get up, or I'll come back next year and give it here. Um, which, much of that experience came out of the Wildflower Triathlon, which I'll talk about. As far as my day job, my day job is I am a solar applications and test engineer at Solar Junction. Solar Junction is a little outfit in San Jose. <coughs> We design and develop multi-junction solar cells, and we hold the second world record for solar cell efficiency. Your typical flat panel silicon you've got on your roof is about 15 or 20 percent if it's really good. Our, our cells are 44 percent. Wow. That being said, what, we're gonna, what, I, what I want to talk to you guys today about is the Wildflower Triathlon. Right? So we're first going to talk about what a triathlon is. Um, kind of the general t idea of how amateur radios support events, which you guys are likely relatively familiar with. Um, so we're going to talk about what we do, the radio sites that we build up, which is kind of my pride and joy in, in the organization, and then our APRS and repeaters, the infrastructure we set up for it, and then finally talking about the counterpoint of our amateur <coughs> operators versus commercial. We actually use commercial radio for this event. Right, and so I'm going to talk about a little bit of the counterpoint on that. Of course, this is a two-way conversation, so if at any point, feel free to interrupt me. Not that I think you guys need encouragement. Um, so first, let's talk about what a triathlon is. A triathlon is a swim, a bike, and then a run. Right, and so a the wildflower the wild for the wildflower event, we actually have four different length courses. Is we have what's called the long course the mountain bike sprint course, an Olympic course, and then an on-road sprint course. So we have two events on Saturday and two events on Sunday of the weekend. The main event is the long course, which is a 1.2 mile swim, a two mile run, which I'll explain in a second, a 56 mile bike ride around the lake, and then another 10.9 mile run around the park itself, right? Uh, the event happens at Lake San Antonio down in South Monterey County, um, and uh, it started in 1983. started in 1983, originally as a bluegrass festival, and they figured, eh, it's a festival, let's have a triathlon, right? The first one had something like, uh, what was it, 86, ath 83 athlete, 86 athletes, 
And reportedly, the, the first and second place finishers cross the finish line in opposite directions. <laughs> Since then, we've got, it's gotten a little bit more organized. It is one of uh, the largest triathlons in the world. Um, when I came on in 2013, there was about 8,000 athletes and another 30,000 spectators inside the park that has one cell phone tower. <laughs> right? Um, Cal Poly, uh, San Luis Obispo, became involved as a source of volunteers for the event in 1985. And the Amateur Radio Club, the Cal Poly Amateur Radio Club, became involved in the mid-1990s. Prior to that, it was uh, the ca County Aries provided some support, and before that, they just won it. And look how that worked out for them. <laughs> right? And so the Cal Poly Amateur Radio Club became involved. Uh, two years ago, our great mentor who worked for the county communications shop um, needed to step down after, after supporting the event for 24 years. And so two of my friends and me, um, Chris, Marcel, and myself, the three of us decided to step up and we took charge of being the primary communications support, which you, which you will see in a moment, um, is a pretty big deal. When I, when I came on there, we had about 8,000 athletes, we had about 30,000 spectators, and we had kind of the event support nailed down. We kind of knew what we were doing, we had a system in place, we pulled the equipment out, we turned it on, we set it up, and then in 2014 there was a drought, and the lake disappeared. The water normally comes up to about here, right, and the tri first part of triathlon is a swim. Right? There's a 1.2 mile swim, and the surface of the lake was 106 feet below the, the launch ramp. You couldn't see the water from the, from the start line. And so the second year I was on the, on, the, on the committee for communications, the triathlon organization TriCal had to reconfigure the course. We went two miles downstream to a place called Harris Creek. We do the swim there. Everyone then runs two miles. You then do the bike ride, and you then, we then took two miles off of the final run itself. Right? So a traditional triathlon is a swim, bike, run. Ours is a swim, run, bike, run. Right? Because the lake disappeared. Um, of course, from a communications perspective, this tossed pretty much all of our plans. And so last, two years ago and last year, we had all sorts of fun scrambling around trying to figure out how do we support an event that has a new start line which always happened to be a dead spot, right? Because Harris Creek was just, it was a run aid station, no one cared, you know, we didn't have good coverage there, but who cares because there was like four guys out there. And now we've got the start line there. Um, so that was a, a relatively large challenge where we had to go find a new radio site on the side of a hill with no budget. As far as the communications committee, um, Hardcore, uh, the active volunteers that we have for the three months ahead of the event, we typically had about 12 to 15 uh, Cal Poly volunteers. And then for the actual event itself, we pull in about 40 to 60 amateur volunteers. Right, as we actually, we, we do it as a whole Cal Poly alumni reunion thing. We have tri-tip and barbecue. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a whole ordeal. So our typical team's about, you know, 30 or 40 to 60 people. Right? And so what, what are we doing for an event like this, right? And this is, this is kind of the part where we're talk, talking generally about events in general. Amateurs bring to the table the logistical ability, the ability to logistically support an event, right? The, my favorite example was always the story of one of the aid stations runs out of oranges, right? Can you imagine on a cell phone trying to call every other aid station to figure out which aid station has spare oranges? and then getting on the cell phone to then start calling rovers until you can find one of the rovers to get there and pick them up, right? And so there's a story that while, while the, the race director is scanning through her cell phone to find the first aid station, we had already put out a call on, net, on the net control, hey, what aid stations have oranges? You know, R4 has oranges, R6 has oranges, all right, R4 is closer, which rovers near, near R4? Go pick up three cases of oranges, take it to R2. Right? And so the fact that we have this one channel that everyone can hear and everyone can listen to is tremendously valuable. The emergency support, of course, is something that we all pride ourselves in, right? In the case of a medical emergency and 
um, there is no cell phone coverage somewhere, we can still get through, right? And so uh, the ability to communicate where no one else can is something that we are quite good at. Um, bringing, no, uh, feeding knowledge back into race command is something that's quite valuable for this triathlon uh, because this triathlon has quite a bit of media coverage. And so one of, the, one, of the major, one of the major sources of traffic for us is play-by-plays out in the course. This athlete's in front of this athlete. This athlete just passed this athlete on this corner. The athletes are coming around this bend. As, as the amateur radio operators, we were feeding a lot of that information in from the course. And then all, much of this information that we passed in our net was then getting re-announced at all the announcer stadiums, was getting live tweeted, was getting handed to the press. And all of these play-by-plays out where there was no cell phone coverage was all coming back in live through amateur radio, right? And so that was it, one of these things that for a century, you know, a little community century ride isn't tremendously valuable except for knowing where your last, you know, last rider is and what's sweeping the course. But for these commercial events, um, was tremendously valuable. Excuse me. Yes. So you're handing out valve fittings to all those people so they can monitor the channel or you're going through net control with that information? Uh, we were going through through net control and then into a computer-aided dispatch system. Yeah, so uh, as far as what the announcers were getting, um, they were listening to a, the information channel, um, as, which was a separate channel from the uh, amateur radio net, um, as well as they were getting handed slips of paper that were having the, these messages transcribed and then handed off. So the 24 bucks a pop, you know, you can get 10 valve things for $250. Mm -hmm. This is true. Um, we don't use bow fangs here. <laughs> but, 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 but for the media people who just want to monitor the channel, I want, I don't know. Uh, each rate, uh, so wait, four. Wait, 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 what are those? These are, I believe these are CP400, uh, CP so these are about $600 Motor, Motorola radios. Uh, we typically mm -hmm. rent them through an outfit called Bearcom. <laughs> it's about $6 per handheld. And so we'll um, rent them through them. But just to finish off the slide, um, amateur radio operators are also relatively well trained, despite our weekly nets. <laughs> right? If there was anything I could change about Aries, it, was scra it would be scrapping the nets, scrapping the roll calls, because it just pains me. I'm, I'm sorry, guys, but when, when every single Tuesday night net is you read the script, you call each person's name, and they say, here, that's not as an effective practice of radio protocol as it could be. Right, because I, I have these operators sit down at my ham dispatch console, and they turn around and go, where's the script? And I went, there's no script, buddy. You're sitting here for the next two hours, solve every problem that comes in on the radio. Right, and in an actual disaster, there's no script. Right, and so like, I can appreciate the value of having a script when you've got a brand new net control operator, but at some point, you've just got to give them bullet items and say, you've got 15 minutes, solve all of these problems. Right, take announcements. Get, find out who's there, get if there's any traffic, close the net, right? And so there, there, there needs to be more emphasis on flexibility in the practice areas nets because when we actually go to a real event like this, it's, it's the guys that didn't, don't do the Tuesday night nets and that just do the event support that tend to be much more flexible and powerful operators. Of course, Amateur radio operators also tend to be relatively well trained in first aid, CPR, um, and other sorts of useful skills out on a athletic course as well as in life, right? And so they, they tend to be more valuable volunteers than others. So let's talk about how big, you know, so this event's about 8,000 athletes. After the drought, it's shrunken down to about 2,000 athletes. So communications by the numbers. For this event, we have about 40 amateur radio volunteers we rent an additional 200 commercial handhelds. We rent 30 commercial mobile rigs. A couple of these go with, uh, or get set up as base stations and dispatch, but many of them are sent out in our SAG vans. So the, all the vans and the buses have these. We have 20 APRS trackers that we put in the ambulances, the SAGs, our chase vehicles, um, the, you know, the, lead, the lead runner, the, the, the guy doing course sweep, and they update on 40 second intervals. Many of the trackers support what's called time slotting, where you can tell them from the top of the hour, transmit precisely 20 seconds afterwards every 40 seconds. 
And so we actually, since we get to build the entire network ourselves, because we're not using the 144.39 frequency, we use a separate frequency, we build the entire thing. And that way we can say, we've got 20 transmitters, so every single transmitter transmits once every, every 40 seconds. And so on the network, if you listen to it, bam, pack it, bam, pack it, bam, pack it. Extremely well designed. Around the course, we set up three I gates. Um, the three I gates depend on five gigahertz microwave links uh, back into a separate APRS IS server. We're not at all dependent upon having internet connectivity. And they're also configured as digipeters that we can remotely turn on. Right, and so if any of the IP links were to go down, we can switch back to this. Right, and so it's, it's very much, we, have, we had no trust in the internet. We have no trust in all of our radio sites staying up. You know, the fault tolerance sort of stuff that you need to think about for an event of this scale that the, the race is starting at 8, 8 a.m. and they don't care if your radios are working or not yet. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes. So the time slots are deterministic, they're set. Yes. Um, it's, a, it's a setting in, in many uh, APRS trackers where you can say, all right, my cycle is 40 seconds long. I want you to transmit 18 seconds past the beginning of the cycle. Top of every hour, it then divides up the hour into these 40 second intervals, and every 18th second it transmits. What happens if one tracker slips and you end up with contention? They have GPS receivers, they're not going to slip. <laughs> right, like the, G the GPS trackers in them are the best source of time that you could have. And who owns those and how? Many of them are personally owned. Uh, TriCal, the organization that runs this, they own something like four or six trackers. And the club also owns something on the order of like 10 or 12. And what's the dollar value of the trackers? <sighs> I don't know. I mean, uh, art, uh, already, what is it? The, we mostly use the micro track AIOs, the all in ones. It's a little orange, yellow Pelican case about this big, mm -hmm. runs on AA batteries. Mm -hmm. They're what, 150 bucks, 200 bucks? Okay. Something like that. Um, and it's, the, I mean, you know. It's kind of hilarious going through 200 AA batteries in a weekend because it's, you know, every day we just drop in all new AA's on them. But the, the, the AIOs are really nice because it's just a little Pelican case. You slap it on the top of the ambulance and they roll out. The biggest challenge we have is actually finding somewhere to put the mag mount because ambulances are mostly fiberglass. <laughs> right? Like we're sitting there like, we're, we're trying to find like the one metal metal stud up in the top. Like, like refrigerator. You can't put any sticker yeah, on the you know, right. New Ford trucks, aluminum. Yeah, something. Well, um, and we use 18 operating frequencies. We've got four amateur frequencies, two repeaters, an APRS frequency, and then a tactical simplex channel that we use around camp. We've got five commercial UHF repeater pairs, and then an additional nine, v, uh, nine simplex channels, one of which is a VHF channel linked. Uh, what? One of them is a, is a VHF channel linked into one of the repeaters, and then three of them are cross bands to other, um, other channels, I guess, and I didn't even count uh, interoperability frequencies such as CalCord for when we fly in a uh, helicopter medevac. Yes, sir? How is the commercial licensing handled? Excellent question. I bought one. $165 and about 12 hours of my time, 10 of those hours sitting down and reading the FCC website, learning how to do it two hours of that time filling out the freaking 601 form on the FCC's terrible, terrible website. I have the call sign WQXE668. It's my commercial call sign. And it's 154 megs? My, the license? No, no, 460 and the channels. Is it 460 or 154? Megahertz. Oh, um, it's a lot. I've got about 25 different frequencies. So what band? Uh, VHF low band, VHF high band, and UHF. That's a mixture. Yeah, I got all, I, I got, um, all of them. What is that, is that 100, you said 150 or It's $165 to fill out and file a 601 form. It, and is that just for the one event that you get to use those? Or it's a 10 year, it's a 10 year license. So, all right, so what I got is I got a business itinerant frequency, <coughs> which is an uncoordinated frequency set. So if I interfere with another commercial user, we have to sort it out, hopefully not with fists. Um, what, it, what it comes down to is certain frequencies in the part 90 business pool are designated as itinerant frequencies. Uncoordinated, everything goes, have fun. And so I sat down and filled out, 
the 601 application saying, I would like this frequency and this frequency and this frequency and this frequency. And I just so happened to list all of the itinerant frequencies because it's one flat rate. And so at the expense that I had to go through every frequency in the business pool and figure out if it was itinerant or not, mm -hmm. I have all of them. Um, filled out that form. If in, for the location, typically on a, a commercial uh, license, what you do is you say within 16 kilometers of this GPS coordinate, I merely said south of line A in the continental US. <laughs> <laughs> so for the next 10 years, I am licensed to oversee the operations of two repeaters and 300, because I just picked a number, I'm like, ah, 300 mobile, mobile stations. That seems about right. <laughs> right, and I've seen licenses go up to 5,000. 5,000 mobile rigs south of line A, so I can't operate next to Canada. Normally, uh, itinerant frequencies do not permit the use of repeaters whatsoever. How did you get around that? That's not at all true. Is that so? Nope. There, you can absolutely license repeaters on itinerant frequencies. What's your ERP? Uh, I'm limited to 35 watts on the repeaters and 30 watts on the mobiles. Yeah. And AFSK is okay? Sorry? AFSK? FSK? I only license them for narrowband FM, but uh, there is no reason why you couldn't have licensed for some other mode. Well, hang on. So the narrowband FM includes FSK? No, I, 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 so it, as part of each line item on the, on the license, I have to say I am operating 11.25 uh, kilohertz analog voice FM. If you wanted to do AFSK, you would have filled out the, the, the line item saying on this frequency, I am operating 11 kilohertz bandwidth AFSK FM. So is it, what are you doing for APRS then? Uh, 144.99. Oh, so you're using that on two meters? Yes, two, okay. me two meter amateur. Okay, yes. so that's the only amateur band you use is for APRS? No, we have two amateur repeaters and an amateur simplex channel, okay. plus APRS, okay. right? So we're, we're, doing, we're doing both. So this is kind of what your typical uh, net control would look like for an event, right? Like a century ride. Um, this was the Lighthouse Century Ride that the Slow Bike Club puts on. Um, and your typical dispatch is going to look like two or three amateurs sitting at a card table in a parking lot. You've got a base station, a pad of paper, maybe a laptop if you're feeling really fancy. This is our dispatch center. Uh, this is a wooden frame that we built that's got Unistrut on the top of it with, uh, what, five, six, seven, eight, nine antennas. Right, so we've got an amateur base station to talk into the, two, into the VHF and UHF repeaters that are cross-linked for the event. It's the W6FM repeater on Williams Hill. Ron's a great guy. So we've got an amateur base station. I've got an APRS iGate there along with an entire APRS IS server. So we, any APRS clients that connect to, can connect to the internet, instead point them at this server inside of our network, and it looks like you're online. Right, so we've got an APRS iGate, so that's the two amateur frequencies. We then have a commercial dispatch console with five radios in front of it and a computer-aided dispatch system, right? Because we've got an amateur operator sitting there collecting information. We've got a commercial dispatcher sitting there collecting information. Um, down the hill at race command, we've got three more operators collecting information. And we've got consumers of information, like the announcer's podiums, like the medical, uh, the EMS manager. And so we end up with about 12 people logged into a computer-aided dispatch system where anyone can open an event ticket, assign units to it, move units around, put notes on, the, on each event, like a medical or a downed biker or you know, anything like that, as well as various notes about what's happening. Right? We use a, a CAD package called Black Flower. It's unremarkable. It's specifically designed for the Wildflower Triathlon and Burning Man. I don't know why it's those two, but it is. We use it, all of our users are trained on it. Um, I know that the, the big, you know, the behemoth CAD, open source CAD package is called Tickets. So if, you, if you're looking at setting up a CAD system for any event, Tickets CAD is the one you want to look at. I don't know anything about it. Um, inside of it, this is looking at um, these three lovely ladies were provided to us by Monterey Parks 
um, as trained medical dispatchers. And we've got five radios here, a laptop here, plus an APRS screen there. The hams are to the back and left of them. Um, things get pretty crazy when you've got two or three dispatch consoles there on you know, six or seven different frequencies. And so uh, the role that I, I typically take up myself as the dispatch supervisor ends up being very valuable. My job is to just stand there and listen. That's it. Um, and so kind of when you have as many balls in the air as you do with 40,000 people in a park, it's useful to have someone just sit there and listen and you know think, wait a minute, I haven't heard about that medical out on mile 22 in a while. Right? And so um, during the actual event weekend, I usually see nothing of the actual event. I'm stuck in this trailer listening to the radios and dealing with problems. Um, so that's my typical role during the event. Um, inside of a dispatch center like this, where you've got more than one person talking at a time, such thing, uh, acoustic design becomes valuable. So we bring roll-out carpets and we, bring, we hang moving blankets on the walls. Right? You, you walk into a, a typical like, community center you know, event room like this one, and it's a little bit echoey and you don't really appreciate how bad that gets when you have three people talking on the radio at the same time. But man, you hang a couple carpets, you, know, you roll out a couple carpets, you hang some moving blankets, and man, it makes a world of difference. Right? So it's one of those things that if, for field day, if you're operating in a, in a, you know, a pre-built structure or a trailer or something, it's valuable to think about. Um, in addition to our dispatch center at the top of the hill, um, down in the actual uh, <coughs> festival area for the event, we have what's called Race Command, which is uh, all of the Tri-Cal employees listening to the event. And down there, they have their own uh, base stations for these same frequencies. They have their own CAD consoles. It's pretty much a whole second set of dispatch so that if, when the third medical comes in within three minutes, which it always does, we can actually ha uh, hand off medicals between the two of us. Because, of course, all the athletes get injured at the same time because they hate us. <laughs> right? It's just, it's awful. Um, so that's, that's, how we actually, that's, that's how we typically operate the event. Is we've got one dispatch set up at the top of the hill, second one at the bottom of the hill. Um, we designate during certain shift hours, one, of the, one is primary on any medical calls that come in. And so all of our volunteers that are scattered across the 12 commercial frequencies are trained. If you have a problem, switch to channel one and call for, call for communications. Right? And if we don't answer within 30 seconds, race command then answers for us. Right? And so that's, that's how we handle the event itself. The problem, well, I wouldn't say the problem. The fun part for me is the two months ahead of time setting up the system. Right? And so we have typically three or four radio sites that we build out across the lake because there's pretty much no infrastructure there. We've got Williams Hill with the W6FM amateur repeaters. So the amateurs tend not to be very much work because I just call up Ron and say, hey, Ron, cross-link these repeaters for us pretty please. We'll donate some money afterwards. Um, and so for the event, for the commercial users, we have to build all of it. None of it's there. Um, the, first, the first site that we typically build out is called Radio Hill. Back when the lake was full, this was pretty much it as far as radio sites. Is we, we had nicely poured a concrete pad. We had a couple of signal boxes mounted there, as you can see here. You know, it was real easy to get to, and pretty much right when we were putting the finishing touches on it and about to mount a, a nice, you know, 40, 50 foot tower there, the lake drained, and this site's relatively peripheral now. Right. As far as what we have there, um, a month before the event, we set up one of the commercial repeaters on one of those 12 hour spa twist timers. Right. And so we've, we have a couple of our users trained that when you show up to the lake and need a repeater for the weekend, someone drives up to the site, yoink. Twist it for 12 hours, and 12 hours later the repeater turns off. Right? Because it's on solar power, that is relatively valuable. Uh, we have a, so that's um, one of the UHS sticks is for that uh, temporary repeater. <clears throat> We've got an X50 there for uh, the uh, APRS digipeter. Um, during the event itself, the digipeter sits silent and is only an eye gate, but I can send it a remote command and say, become a digipeter again, and it'll become a digipeter. Uh, we also have a VHF and a UHF commercial stick there, um, which together are a crossbander into the park rangers' radio systems that are all VHF, so that our users that are all UHF-only handhelds can talk directly to rangers when we need police enforcement, which we typically usually do, 
is it's, it's not unusual for us to get a couple of athletes or spectators a little rowdy or volunteers a little bit rowdy <laughs> and we'll have rangers come out and talk to them. Um, again, this is just my understanding that the cross service uh, interconnections are, are not permitted between uh, commercial and public safety, public safety frequencies. How do you how do you get around that, or is that just a permission? Deal? We have we have signed memorandums of understanding as well as faxed notifications that we send out. By the the FCC and the FCC rules, you're not permitted. Like like as an example, I got to just ask the question. Uh, I have commercial radio using a six meter. It has a mobile repeater capability. Now I can hook it up to receive uh, low band bar frequencies and rebroadcast them on ham frequencies. That is strictly verboten because you cannot connect the, the two, my understanding. Uh, so do you bo do both that? sides of the crossband are a part 90. Okay. Right, so the VHF side is the Monterey Parks um, licensed repeater that they have there. The UHF side is one of our licensed simplex channels. So there's nothing, the only thing amateur radio about this site is the APRS Digipeter. Um, and we have a five gigahertz point to point link out here. Um, this is all powered by a 400 watt solar panel here um, and a 100 amp hour uh, uh, gel battery, which is a whole nother talk. Yes, sir? Is that the unlicensed GSM band, 5 gig? Uh, it is part 15, unlicensed. So, I, five, five four decades. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I've, I, I don't use, I do quite a few projects on 5 gigahertz. Mm -hmm. And I've never done part 97 on it because I really, really like encryption. And particularly when you put 30,000 people in a park that all really, really want internet, having anything open is a bad idea. Yes, sir? I'm sure you get to this some, at some point, but talk about your budget. <laughs> oh, uh, our typical budget, um, we, for capital expenditures, we have about $1,000 um, per year. Uh, we then have another couple hundred dollars in directed donations that we send to the amateur radio organizations that support us and then our radio rental is several thousand more dollars um, as part of the, the rental right so that's uh, right these guys right so we've got 200 HTs 30 mobile rigs uh, what we traditionally did was, did was we rented the repeaters from Bearcom as well right handhelds are relatively easy to program right you just put the channels in and they're there Right? They have to have labels. God, it's hard. Repeaters. God, repeaters. Not only do you have to put the right channels in there, you got to tune a duplexer. you got to have like the power supply set up right and cables. And the duplexers have to be like tuned for the right frequencies. And the two antenna ports have to be plugged into the right ones on the duplexers. And it was just a shit show every year. Right? These repeaters would show up Thursday night for the event. <laughs> Right, and the fact that they were showing up Thursday and not Friday night was because we twisted Bearcom's arm and said, no, even though we're only renting it for the weekend, we need it sooner. They'd show up all sorts of misconfigured, and our entire Thursday night would be spent just fixing repeaters. And so two years ago, we finally just said, had had it, and we went on eBay, and we started buying GR1225 Motorola repeaters. They're only like 400, 500 bucks a piece. Right? Most of them don't work, but if you open them up and reflow all the solder joints on the PA, right? the, uh, most of them actually showed up and rattled. <laughs> the, the, the primary failure mode for GR1225 repeaters is that all the solder in the PA would melt and a component would fall off. <laughs> the components are perfectly fine, they're just no longer attached to the board. I've never had to replace a component in a GR1225, I just had to solder it back onto the board. And so I actually, for afterwards, have brought one of uh, all of our uh, one of our repeaters, so you guys can see what those look like as well. Um, they just so cheap; they won't buy uh, better solder with silver bearing solder. Or well, so, so hot. The the problem is the twelve twenty five is rated for one hundred percent duty at twenty five watts, five minutes on, five minutes off at forty five watts. Right. In what universe are you going to be able to enforce on your commercial users? If you've talked for five minutes, don't talk anymore. <laughs> right? I mean, like, no one, no one keeps track of that. And so everyone was at it for 45 watts, and then their users would melt the PAs. It didn't help that Motorola specced out the thermal switch on the fan incorrectly. So it only switched on at 125 degrees Fahrenheit fin temperature. 
I'm sorry, by the time that my fins on my heat sink are 125 degrees, I want the fan to have already been running. So in all of our repeaters, we actually have the fans hardwired on. Right, forget the noise, who cares? All right, so there's our dispatch center. There's Radio Hill. Um, like I said, we have, we're using five gigahertz IP links. And so, uh, here, uh, so here's the start line here. So the swim course went like this. Um, the athletes then run up here to the transitions area where they get on their bikes and they go around the course. So we've got our dispatch center here with a point-to-point -point IP link to the festival area here. Um, at our main radio site, which I'm about to talk to you about on the next slide, we've got a sector antenna, so it's about a 90-degree beam width, with clients at the festival area, Radio Hill, and at Harris Creek. Um, so we have eye gates here and here that are backhauled to dispatch, right? So that's where our APRS network comes in. And then between the festival area here and Harris Creek, we've got a VPN bridge for the timing mats. The RFID maps that the athletes run over, they don't use IP, they use Ethernet. And so they all have to be on one layer two broadcast domain. All right. And so we have to, over VPN, bridge that. Is if that, that why the microtech is handy for that? Because uh, you're bridging with the microtech? No, we're bridging with uh, all sorts. I, I, I'm not involved with that no. other than I, like, I, was, I was told we need VPN transit between here and here. All right, I'll allow the traffic. Um, but it's, it's, they're terrible if they see the wrong, wrong packets from certain, like certain switches would crash our entire timing network. Oh. So it was a bad time. Um, if none of that made sense, my apologies, let's move on. Ah, uh, this is my pride and joy, Benchmark. It's called, the radio site's called Benchmark because we were, we were out there walking around and we tripped over a USGS benchmark, <laughs> right? These are the survey benchmarks. Man, does the USGS really know good way, like great places to put radio sites? Because this is not the only time I have tripped over a, a benchmark at a radio site. I was uh, down in Death Valley, and we set up a radio site on the eastern ridge of Death Valley for an event. And my job during the event itself was to sit in the car and make sure the repeater worked. 14 hours, I was to sit there and look at the repeater and make sure it worked. Right, and after a couple hours, nature calls, so I go walk out into the bushes and trip over a USGS benchmark, <laughs> right? Does this have something to do with civil engineering and survey? Right, it's like civil, it's like civil engineering guys know, know where mountain, pe mountain peaks are or something, right? Like it's, it turns out that like line of sight's useful for both of those activities. So we took a completely blank hillside. It was owned by one of the neighbors of the park. So we just found the guy. Actually, what happened was we were wandering around onto his property, and then he met us with a rifle and a pair of binoculars. <laughs> hey, what are you doing here? So we had a real friendly chat, and he was perfectly happy with us setting up this radio site. And so on a blank hillside, we brought out uh, the Cal Poly Amateur Radio Club's tower trailer. It's about a 40-foot crank up. Set it up. We brought out two more sections of Roan 25, which is you know, the triangular tower section. It's about this big. So we brought out 20 feet of that. Set it up as well and a whole hell of a lot of T-posts have been way too deep in this real like hard pack rocky soil. We have never successfully extracted one of those T-posts afterwards. They were all destroyed. Every single one of them, we, try, we, like, we, we weren't willing to leave, leave them in because we were afraid that they were gonna come out of a grater or something. So every year we try and get them out somehow, you know, and then we'd always inevitably break it off. So, there, so up there, there is a dozen one foot sections of T-posts left in the hillside. That's my legacy. Um, <clears throat> as far as what we've got, <laughs> We've got about a 12-foot mast here with a UHF vertical, two telewave folded dipoles. Those are all commercial. We've got a VHF commercial rig, uh, stick, a X50 for the APRS digipeter, uh, two more UHF folded dipoles, a 5 gigahertz access point, and the most important component of the entire radio site, a 12-volt strobe light. Any guesses on what the 12 volt strobe light was for? Aircraft. <laughs> no. It wasn't wired into the battery backup system, so at any moment you could look across the lake and see if the generator was running. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, year before, the year before this, someone accidentally plugged it into the backup system. And would you believe that's the one year the generator died? Um, as far as where all the radios are housed, it's a six foot U Haul trailer. 
This is inside of the, the six foot trailer. So we've got the five, uh, four UHF itinerants, a UHF uh, UTAC interoperability repeater. That's how we talk to the ambulances. Um, VHF uh, VTAC link, APRS digipeter, um, power injectors, and a webcam. <laughs> This is an IP webcam. They're real great, right? You put them on the network, and then you can just point a web browser at it, and it shows you what it's looking at. Right here, we've got an LED voltmeter plugged into the battery bank. And so when we want to know what the battery bank voltage is, we log into, into the webcam and look at the voltmeter. There's that. We also wanted to have repeater usage statistics, right? Because we're, we're setting up five repeaters. And, it, and it, for various years, we've set up anywhere between four and nine repeaters. When you've got nine repeaters set up, you kind of want to know, did we actually need nine repeaters or not? Right? So you want to have some sort of usage statistics on when were which repeaters keyed up. We looked at, like, well, could we wire something into the COR pins on each one? But the GR1225s are these nice metal enclosures that we don't want to open out in the field. And we'll have all sorts of ground loops then, so that'd be, that wouldn't be a good deal. Guess how we collected statistics on the event? This is, this is my favorite part. Video record. Uh, kind of. Every 10 seconds, we cap I, I wrote a little shell script that every 10 seconds captured an image off the webcam and saved it on the hard drive. And post facto, used computer vision to look <laughs> at the transmit LEDs on the five repeaters. <laughs> is the LED lit up or not? That was how we, that was how we collected our, our, our use of statistics on the repeaters. Um, this year, it was about 10 to 12% usage continuously with peaks up to about 25% uh, key up at various points during the event on the four different channels. <sighs> cool. Um, we've got three uh, 100 amp hour flooded lead acid batteries. This is the last year we used floodeds. Um, we have since converted to all absorbent glass mat to hell with flooded batteries. You, like It's slightly more expensive to get AGMs they're below $2 an amp hour, and it's not worth trying to train hams on sulfuric acid protocol. Right, so we have converted to all AGMs. Um, just kind of give you an idea of the sort of planning that goes involved, we have several diagrams like this. This is just the DC distribution at this site. Um, we have several of those diagrams for pre-event and actual during the event. Right, so you can see we've got a Honda 2000i generator that goes to a 100 amp hour, uh, 100 amp power supply that runs a couple things, um, right, runs the strobe with no battery backup and has an analog tap onto the APRS digipeter so we can get telemetry off of it. We've got a power gate from West Mountain Radio charging 300 amp hours of batteries, repeater, 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 uh, digipeter, uh, ferrite chokes. Uh, even at UHF we were getting some hash out of our switching power, uh, switching power supply devices. Um, networking equipment, boost converters for the uh, microwave sector sites, and then a couple of the repeaters weren't battery backed at all, right? We took a very tactical decision about, well, what needs to stay up and what can we shed right away when the generator dies, right? And so a couple of the systems were very tactically not backed up so that our other systems could last longer. Which brings us to kind of the most controversial part of this whole system. Um, I've gotten a tremendous amount of hate because we use commercial radio for this event. I get nasty grams regularly, but how dare I, you know, violate the amateur trust and take all this knowledge that you guys have trained me, right? Because I, I would know nothing about repeaters and digipeters and APRS if it wasn't for the amateur radio community. It's a tremendously valuable resource. And then how dare I then go and set up commercial repeaters and give mere pleb mortals radios and let them talk on the radio during an event. Right? This, is the, this is the sort of feedback I get from people. And it's relatively frustrating. But commercial has got a lot of comp pros for it. Right? $165, I, I have a license for the next 10 years, I can show up at any event, and I can sit there and christen people to be on the radio. Right? The FCC, FCC doesn't need to be directly involved at that point. Right? And so Thursday night, I get up, I, I get up in front of all of our volunteers, give them about a 20-minute radio lesson on point the antenna this way. This is the button you push on the side, speak here, don't curse, right? It's, it's a relatively, I, I keep, try and keep it very entertaining and engaging. 
And then we've got 200 more volunteers with radios. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't see how we can get 250 amateurs out to an event like this. And there's no way that our amateurs can keep up with some of our TriCal staff. Like, the uh, race director, she is just a speed demon on wheels. Like, it is unbelievable trying to keep up with her. Thankfully, this year, she actually managed to pull her Achilles tendon. And so she was a little, well, it was a little bit easier to find her. I mean, it didn't slow her down that much. But. Um, there's also the problem that many of the TriCal staff are paid, right? How do I talk to a TriCal staff member during the weekend, right? They can't transmit on the amateur radio frequencies. And so by having, right, having them on a commercial radio, I can keep up the radio anytime and talk to these people that are tremendously important for the event with no limitations on what, on what we can talk about. Right? And so there's a lot of advantages to commercial um, that is you know, one of the main drivers behind why like we, we do both. We have a hybrid communications infrastructure here. We do both. And what they lack in skill and make up for in sheer numbers. <laughs> right? I, I, will, I, I will never deny that on the one cross-linked repeater, the 40 amateurs pass more traffic more effectively than the 200 users on the 12 commercial frequencies. Right, those guys are walking over each other. They're not understanding it. They're, you know, responding to calls for other people. Right, they don't. They're not. They're not as well trained as we are. But when you've got 200 of them, they get the job done eventually. Right. And we've also been training them for 20 years. Right. I mean, you know, yeah, the first first few years must have been horrific. But you know, every every year we build their skill. And I mean, I'm afraid that you know, the, operating this one weekend is about as much experience as some hams get, right? And so, I mean, these guys are getting pretty good, right? And so, you know, your your friends that show up for event support that don't do anything else during the year, right? I mean, you know, you should encourage them to get on the air more, right? Because amateur radio is fun, right, guys? Right? Yes, sir. This seems like a very complicated system. Yes. Did you just sit down one night and think, <laughs> oh, I've got it. This is what we're gonna do. <laughs> I am three quarters of the way through this notebook, and this is only since about a year ago, right? And so th this right here, we started the planning for this event in November. It happened last weekend. So no, this is, this is, this is a, a passion of mine where several of us sit down six months in advance and say, all right, what do we want to accomplish this year? What's our stretch projects, right? What's our stretch goals? Because every year we got to do something fun and hard, right? And every year, once TriCal finds out that we have some new stretch, you know, project, like, oh, we need that every year, <laughs> right? Um, let's see. The point, uh, the point-to-point -point link up, up the hill like that, that had been happening for about a decade. We set up this new radio site that's uh, what, 5.6 kilometers away, and I went, ah, long-range Wi-Fi links. That sounds like something fun. So I buy myself a pair of nano bridges which are ubiquities, and I very quietly set it up between uh, the, the uh, timing cabin in Festival and Benchmark. TriCal then finds out about it and goes, ah, that's mission critical, we need that for the timing mats. <laughs> right, and this happens every year. We set up some new system, it's just, it's just for fun, you know, because trying to set up the same super complicated system, we pull our hair out and quit. Um, so we do these little stretch goals every year, and it just feature creeps. Right, and so it, it, it got, it's gotten a little bit ridiculous, um, but we love it. Yes? Is this a fundraising event for some? This is a commercial triathlon. Um, many of the athletes, I mean, there are a couple cash prizes for the elite athletes that are completing the course in something like three, three and a half hours. Um, I believe it's a qualifying at, uh, race for the Ironmen. Ironman uh, courses, so there's quite a bit of prestige in being able to get below certain times on it because it allows you to participate in other events. Um, but it's certainly not a fundraiser like JDRF um, or the Slow Bike Club or anything. No, this is this is a strictly commercial experience. Uh, if it's a commercial event, how are you legally permitted to use amateur radio? I'm not paid. No, but you, amateur radio is not permitted for, for commercial uses at all. We're not talking about anything commercial. We're doing we're event support. We're feeding back in the lead athletes, which helps us with logistics, and we're having a good time. None, none of us on the amateur radio are getting paid for it. None of us are, are in any way uh, 
related to any but of the cap the, prices. The underlying event is making money commercially. <coughs> yes. Right? Then it's, it's not an amateur event. It's a commercial event. To my mind, that's an extremely restrictive way of interpreting part. That's my understanding of how, how, the, how, the, code, how the code is written. I don't think and so. I have I've no, been told I, that by several people. So, and you know what? I, I, I don't I, know I've always had a fundamental disagreement with ARRL. Um, the ARRL always seems to take the most pessimistic interpretations of Part 97, mm -hmm. and I can understand why they're doing it, but some of us actually want to yeah. use radios for something useful. So, Kenneth, these things seem to be the, the biggest thing in my head. Um, of all the multiple junk you've got up there, what is the most susceptible to these things? Uh, the amateur base station. And what kind of base station is it? Uh, 88, the Azu 8800, wow. but it, I mean, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, everything else is Motorola, and we, the only place that, so the, our, two, our two issues of interference is anything going into the amateur radios and uh, intermodulation between all the repeaters, right? So let's talk about the, the amateur interference first. I hate amateur radios, right? I, I understand why they want to put it, the sticker on the box about how this radio receives from 500 kilohertz all the way up to 999, <laughs> but God, I wish they put some sort of front end on it so I could only do UHF on it, right? Because it would be so much more useful, right? Because at events like this, where I've got nine antennas on a 10-foot piece of Unistrut, when I go to commercial radio sites to do tower climbing, which I do as well, I can't use amateur equipment there because it's garbage, right? And so the amateur base station it typically gets descents from our commercial guys. Mm -hmm. um, and then all of our repeaters um, at one site like this, uh, this is nowhere near enough antenna separation between separate repeaters. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that we're using portable notch only duplexers makes the issue all the much more worse. And so part of our preparation that I do in this wonderful notebook ahead of time, I do a full intermod study on this radio site like it was a permanent commercial site. We had a seventh order intermod hit, right? That is the uh, fourth harmonic of one repeater and the third harmonic of another repeater mix in any rusty joint on the tower and heterodyne down to the input to a different repeater. And so any time that our security repeater and our race repeater were keyed up, they'd key up our director's repeater, right? And so we, we did this intermod studies. We put a pass cam on one of the repeaters, and every single repeater has a different input PL and output PL, right? So on the five repeaters, we use nine different PL tones, right? And so at least the intermod stopped being sustaining, right? Because the worst thing is it, sustaining intermod, where two repeaters key up each other and hold them on until they time out five minutes later, right? And so. Tremendous amount of issues with the intermod there. But as far as descents, any commercial rate, uh, commercial, decent commercial radio, almost no descents. So what do you do for APRS? Because that's my particular concern. What receivers are you using? For uh, M primarily MCX-1000s. I don't know what that is. Uh, Motorola Motor radios. Oh, so you're using commercial radios? Uh, yes. Uh, the Cal, uh, Cal Poly Amateur Radio Club and the Slow Aries group has a tremendously close relationship with the San Luis Obispo County. And so when the San Luis Obispo County uh, Police Department decommissioned all of their wideband <coughs> uh, radios, they all went to Slovak, right? And so we got a pallet with like 40 or 50 GM300s on it. And that's every packet radio in the entire county is a X county um, GM300. Yeah. Thank you. Have you considered uh, for the future going to to digital or going to trunk or going to trunk digital? Yes. Is the motor, motor turbo or P25 or some? Every, every year uh, our rental company tries to sell us on the concept of going to motor turbo and they always say, hey, the range on motor turbo is longer than on analog, right? And the thing is, so here's Radio Hill. Here's a ridge line, here's a ridge line, Here's a ridge line. Here's a ridge line. About 80% of the course is fringe coverage. And on analog, fringe coverage sounds terrible. On digital, fringe coverage doesn't exist. 
And so, yeah, we are still narrow band analog because most of our users are fringe coverage. And with analog, uh, there's a lot of hints about when you're starting to lose coverage, right? If we, if we had these people out there that don't really understand how the radios are working yeah. and the radio just goes silent, how are we expecting them to figure out which, which direction to walk to try and get better coverage, right? And so every year it is a discussion. Every year we carefully consider, man, it would be so nice if we had a trunking system between all these radio sites so that people could, you know, have talk groups. It'd be super awesome. It wouldn't work. Or we don't have the skills to do it. Do you anticipate the, uh, it, 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 just my opinion, that, that uh, pretty soon they're going to stop making analog radio? Or, or is that not the, the case? Because of the, the way the market's going. See, the GR1225 was introduced in what, 1993? I don't even know if they sell GR1225s anymore. I don't, I don't think they do. Yeah. Most, of our, most of our radios are already end of life. Right, so yeah, in 15 or 20 years, that may be a real issue. I hope I'm not involved anymore. <laughs> <laughs> There's another question. Do you accomplish all of this with, on a budget of a couple thousand dollars a year? Uh, a, a actual capital budget, less than a thousand dollars. Including renting all those radios, and all, or is that the event? Uh, the, the, the radio rental from Bearcom is a separate budget. R renting the repeaters from me, because um, what I did two years ago is I started my own business just to rent repeaters to the Wildflower Triathlon because I was tired of it. On um, that being said, they sit in my closet the other 10 months of the year if you want to rent a repeater for something. <laughs> talk to me. Um, so that's separate. But as far as the capital expenditures for the antennas, the coax, the digipeters, our base stations that aren't rented, um, all of everything that's actual tactile and sits there and isn't a rented handheld or mobile rig, um, that's all thousand dollars right and a lot of it's because we have um, 5 13 14 22 20, uh, 25 we have about 25 commercial antennas in a shipping container up there right so we buy two or three of those a year which barely keeps up with them breaking um, we've got 1500 feet of coax in various lengths that we've just collected over the over the air years um, ever, all the computer networking stuff inside of Dispatch is my personal equipment that I bring out and donate because they enabled me to learn how to build repeaters, right? And so I'm, I'm absolutely giving them back all of my uh, servers and stuff for the event itself. But yeah, less than $1,000. Can you put your email address back up? Yeah. There's my email address, Kenneth Finnegan2007 at Gmail. My blog is blog.thelifeofkenneth.com, where I write about the life of Kenneth. It's a relatively interesting life, I like to think. I have one. It's right there on the blog, thelifeofkenneth.com. It's pretty good. It's like decent, it. right? It's, you know, it's... And then I'm also on Twitter if you want to listen to my daily 140-character snark. Any other questions? Very good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. With that... Yeah.